Okie dokie. Oh. A podcast for those addicted to the study of scripture. Welcome fellow addicts, this is your safe place to OD. Samuel! Here I am. <laughs> what are we going to talk about today? Today we are starting our continued journey of the Gospels. This is Gospels Part 2. So Paul, would you like to uh, continue contextualizing where we are starting from where we left off on the previous episode? Sure. Yeah, we uh, we started out our run through the Gospels looking at part of chapter 1 of John. And because our our goal is to kind of walk through all of the Gospels simultaneously, we're going to now make a move over to Luke. We're going to do Luke chapter 1. I don't know how far we'll make it today, but we'll be optimistic, say we're going to do it. And, uh, well, I think that's it. That's what you wanted to know. Great. Okay. So where should we start in the text? Well, I'm going to surprise you. I'm going to have you read me Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Okay. Okie dokie. Luke 1, 1. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Okay. Now, uh, do you remember last episode we were kind of making jokes about what do people do in their head? How did they turn John 1 into a single word? What was that word? Jesus. Yeah. So they they all they they would read the whole thing and they just walk away going Jesus. Now you read those four verses. What do you think people do after they've read those four verses? What do they walk away with in their head? Seems like a big introduction. <laughs> yeah. Or Intro. like some type of greeting. Yeah. Greeting. Something. They just it all gets smashed up into a single word or whatever. They're just done and they're moving on. Right. Which is very understandable. Because sometimes all this wording gets very, um, it just kind of runs together and you're, you stop really hearing what's actually being communicated. So we're going to take a second. We're just going to try to back up and find out why did Luke bother to write these four verses? So let's begin with this. So common understanding is that Luke is a Gentile and that he is a physician and that he traveled with Paul. And I think we could even, you know, if, if those things are true, it's it's really not a stretch to think that he probably had a pretty good education, pretty good command of the Greek language. And the reason that that might actually be relevant is because this first paragraph really stands out in the Greek, right? If If we were all experts at speaking, reading, writing Greek, we would look at this and we'd go, man, what is up with those first four verses? They got, I mean, they've got all kinds of stuff in there. Yeah, the fact that the first word is in as much, that's pretty wordy. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it already throws half of the population off. It's like, I don't even know what that means, right? But here's the thing, in the Greek... It, it stands out uh, like it, it's almost like someone who is is trying to actually greet someone who's of great importance. Maybe they're some sort of royalty or uh, a town leader of some kind or uh, maybe just some rich guy in the neighbor. I don't know, something. But it really, really stands out. And as soon as you get down to verse 5, everything that follows for the next chapter or two seems pretty pretty common man Greek. I mean, it's totally different. And I don't know, I just think it's important that we understand, in some sense, you might get the idea that Luke has has brought in other sources. Either he's copied them himself and he was faithful to what he was copying, or maybe he literally, like, included materials in. 
But somehow, this introduction really stands out. But there's a couple of things in it that I'd like to point out just because, I don't know, they could be important. So instead of just reading four verses and thinking, okay, greeting, got it, we might say this. Uh, For example, who is this Theophilus? Now, I think it's very reasonable to look at that and go, look, he's, he's probably someone of importance. And we might even buy into the idea that maybe he's funding Luke. He's heard about all this stuff. He might even be a believer, but he wants, he wants the best information that he can get. And so he might even be paying Luke to put this stuff together. He's also the guy that Luke writes to at the beginning of Acts, okay? But there are other people who look at this and think, well, I don't know. I don't think he was really a person. I think that Luke is just kind of, he's he's creating this iconic, faithful Christian kind of person. It's not even a real person. Uh, Luke's just speaking to anyone who is a believer. They are the most excellent Theophilus, right? Now, I, you know, they've got a lot of good reason behind it, but I don't really buy into that one. But the, the end of that story is we just don't really know who this guy is, but we can at least kind of break down what it is he's saying. And his basic points are these. A whole bunch of people have, so far, written about this Jesus, the Messiah. You know, the, the works that he did, um, his apostles, everything, Right. They've written about what God's accomplished for mankind, right? So so gospel stories exist. Even the eyewitnesses, the ones who were actually walking around with Jesus, okay, some of them have written accounts. But Luke himself, he's not an eyewitness. He's at least a second generation guy. But he has keenly followed all of these things everything that's related, everything that's relevant. And so what Luke believes he can bring to the table, especially what he wants to uh, bring to Theophilus, is he wants to compile a well-ordered account. He wants to provide a well-verified account of all of these things. Something that Luke believes can actually bring some certainty to his readers, that these things are factual and true. Okay, so from what I hear you saying is that it probably could get overwhelming for a particular reader or seeker or skeptic of trying to figure out who Jesus is based on the amount of people who had some sort of account about him and Luke took it on himself to try to come up with a concise narrative from those multiple accounts to give to the general public. Yeah, yeah. Luke really believes that he's doing something that is, you know, somewhat unique and special, bringing this well-ordered account. And do you know, did the people who were receiving his letters know about his professional background in terms of him being uh, well-educated and a professional that would aid the credibility of what he was writing? Well, I'm sure very early on they did. Most often when letters or or like something big like a gospel, whatever, um, when these things were distributed, it was often uh, that a person or a, a pair of individuals would bring this thing to a community and they would be the ones that would read it, and they would be the ones that would actually provide all of the extra information in the backstory, maybe even kind of sort of like what we're doing in this podcast. Okay, that helps. All right, so now remember, first four verses, this was Luke's big intro, but now this is something that he's either copied in or, or like we would say, he's pasted it in or whatever. He's added it in here, but this is going to be uh, some very interesting stories leading up to Jesus, but let's get started. In verse 5, he says, In the days of Herod, the king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name 
was Elizabeth. All right, couple of points. First of all, Herod helps us figure out a time frame. He ruled from about 37 BC up through about 4 BC. And so for anybody who's trying to figure out when was Jesus born and all that kind of stuff, you're going to have to get that in play because Herod, his rule stopped at 4 BC. So Jesus had to be born, I mean, at the latest, somewhere around that time. But we're in Judea and, and, and we have a couple of people involved. It's a husband and wife. We've got Zechariah and Elizabeth. And interestingly, they are both Levites. And not just Levites, they are both from the line of Aaron, Moses' brother, the original high priest. That's a big deal, right? Yeah, it's a very big deal. And, you know, it, it wasn't that there was any sort of rule that they had to marry within, you know, the line or something like that, but it was reasonably common that they would have tried to keep the lines relatively pure. So. Anyway, there's that. Um, And then you've got uh, Zechariah, that name. It means the Lord remembers. But Elizabeth means the oath of God. And so you put those two together and it's the Lord remembers the oath of God, right? The Lord remembers Mm -hmm. his own oath, which... I mean, at some point, you even have to step back and go, man, is Luke really telling a story about two real people? Or did he did he actually make up these names to add to the story, right? You never really know. Mm-hmm. But then another thing, it says that, that Zechariah is from the division of Abijah. All right. So this is very interesting. There were, okay, at this time that we're talking about, there were Probably there were more than ten thousand priests, okay, and they had been broken up into twenty four divisions. This actually, I think David was the one that actually started all this thing, but each division would serve for one week in the first half of the year and one week in the second half of the year. So basically, Zechariah was on duty as a priest two weeks out of the year, plus. They would have to serve during all the uh, pilgrimage festivals, so like Pentecost and Passover, that kind of thing, right? Um, and you can actually read more about that if you want to. You go back and look at First Chronicles 24, verses 1 through 10. You can see some of the info about that, right? You with me so far? I think so. Yep. All right. Okay. So what we're trying to do here is paint a picture. And and this is what Luke has said so far. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there's a priest named Zechariah, division of Abijah. He had a wife from the daughters of Aaron. Her name was Elizabeth. Verse 6. And they were both righteous before God. What? Walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren. And both were advanced in years, which is a nice way of saying they were old, like me. Yeah. <laughs> I bet some right? red flags are flying right now, though, based on what people just heard. Yeah, yeah. Think about this. Luke has just claimed that Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's estimation. What? Now, I, I, I don't know about you, but when I go to church... And I don't mean any particular church. I've been in all kinds of churches all over the place. But what do you usually hear about people, Samuel? There is no one righteous, not even one. Exactly. And we're all just... We're just sinners saved by grace. We got filthy rags. Yeah. Yeah. But now all of a sudden, Luke, he's breaking the mold here with Zechariah and Elizabeth. Well, what what is he talking about? Okay. So... You got to understand when you are reading your Bible and somebody says that someone else is righteous, what they are saying is that they are walking out the law. They are living in accordance with the Torah, and that is the law, but it's not just the law, it's the whole first five books. They are walking it out well. 
They are doers. They are not just hearers. And if you can imagine, I'm sure they weren't perfect. So there's this big difference between someone who is perfectly righteous, like Jesus, and then someone else who is merely righteous, meaning that on the whole, their life is it, it's, it's good in God's eyes. God looks on them and goes, you know what? I'm pleased. I am pleased. So this wouldn't have been a problem in a Jewish uh, reader's ears to hear someone being called righteous, correct? Not in any way. In fact, uh, there were righteous people who had lived in the eyes of Jews and Judaism all throughout Jewish history. And of course, we know Jewish history is filled with a lot of failure, right? Mm -hmm. But a, an individual can definitely walk out a righteous life. It's just, it's just a normal thing. And so there's one of those areas where we need to re-imagine re the world that we're reading in, right? Now, part of the reason that their righteousness is important is because Luke also tells us that they had no child. What Luke is actually doing is connecting those two, trying to show the reader, hey, it wasn't their fault that Elizabeth was barren. Because a lot of times, especially in this time period when this was written, they, they did make a connection. They said, look, if, if you are righteous, then everything in your life should go well. And if you are not righteous, well, then everything in your life should be bad. And if your life is bad, you must have done something wrong. Now, we know that that's not a, a good, solid, complete view of how that works, but it was, at the time, a fairly popular way to look at people in their lives. So Luke wants it known, hey, they were righteous, and she was barren. It wasn't her fault. She wasn't being punished by God, okay? Now... You know, something else This is probably also important. Again, we're trying to paint this picture, trying to get this all in our head. For Zechariah, he actually was well within his rights. It would have been acceptable in that time and place for him to either divorce Elizabeth or to just take another wife for the purposes of bearing him a son. Actually having a son, being able to, to carry on the name and all that kind of stuff is a very, very important part of the culture. Has some patriarchal callbacks. Yeah, for sure. For sure. It was very important to them. But notice they're advanced in years, well advanced in years. And Zechariah only has eyes for Elizabeth. <laughs> right? It's just like Abraham and Sarah. He loved her, and he remained devoted to her alone, even though she could produce no heir. Mm -hmm. Right? So that's, that's awesome. That, yeah, it's a beautiful picture. And we usually just read right by it. <laughs> right? But here's another point. What usually happens in the Bible when it tells you that someone is barren? Something's about to happen. That's right. There's going to be a miracle, right? And the baby also is probably going to be special in some way, a special calling, special role, something. And of course, this is it's in line with Sarah and Rebecca and Rachel and Hannah, and I'm sure there are others, right? Um, so there you go. Uh, Luke, so now we know who the important players are in the story thus far. Luke set it up. We have a little more information about them. And he gets down to verse 8. Now, while he, and this would be Zechariah, of course, while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, so this was one of the, either the week in the first half of the year or the week in the second half of the year, while his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. Now that, you know, that probably doesn't seem like there's a lot of information in there, but there's a lot of stuff going on, right? So, so 
Here's a little, a little background. Even though, let's say you're a priest, you're just like Zechariah, even though your division is on duty for the week, okay, you still only got to participate for probably like one day out of that week, right? You, you weren't serving even every single day. And there were certain duties that the priests did, and, and many of those were limited by casting lots. So you only got to do a certain thing if you, you know, won the lottery, if you want to say it that way. Mm-hmm. And there were also some that uh, you only got to do it once in your lifetime. And some people never even got to do it because it was so rare. Okay. So now here's Zechariah and he's been chosen by lot to burn the incense. Well, this was one of those duties that was limited to only once in your lifetime. So Zechariah had never done it. He's old, but today was his day. He was going to get an opportunity to be alone with God as close as any man could ever get to his presence, except for the high priest once a year, right? This was a big deal. I mean, out of this guy's entire life, this was a big deal. Yeah. And yeah. Talk about needing to be prepared if your name gets called. Like That places more context on how priests were to hold themselves if that day and time came for them. Yeah, yeah. Because if you're going in the presence of God, you need to be on your game. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and for them, for the priests, there were two things that were important. There was purity in a physical sense. They had to, you know, stay away from dead bodies or, I don't know, leprosy or this or that. They had to keep pure in a, in a physical sense. But they also needed to remain pure uh, from the perspective, the way we would think of it, from sin, right? They needed to be uh, pure. And, and, and if there was any issues, it would have had to have been dealt with before they started their, their service. So yeah, it's, it's, it's just a huge deal. So then Luke goes on and he says this, and the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. Okay, so Zechariah has been chosen. He's going to get to do this job. And there's a whole bunch of people waiting out in the temple courtyard at this time. This was a big deal every single day. There were other priests. There were Levites. And what I guess we would think of as just normal everyday worshipers. They regularly gathered out in the courts. They wanted to witness this service and they would pray the prayers. They had, like we would think of it as liturgy, they had specific prayers that were prayed at specific times of day, that kind of thing. They were all waiting out there to do that. And here was Zechariah for the one and only time in his life. He's going in with this shovel. He's going into that incense altar. It's got the burning coals on and he's going to, he's going to pour out that incense and he is going to offer prayers to God. Now, the question is, what prayers? He may have been doing the prayers, just like everyone else, but he may also have been offering his own prayers. He, maybe he was praying for the Messiah to come, or maybe he was praying that he might have a son, even though he's old and advanced in years. <laughs> Right? I mean, here he is. He's got an audience with God. Why not go for broke? Yeah. <laughs> Talk about a belief that he thought that God was capable of still doing something like that. I mean, yeah. If I was that advanced in years, I would just think it was an impossibility. Yeah. But he had the stories. He had it, the stories. It's crazy. Yeah. And, and this, we often, we often overlook these things as well because we get the, yeah, you know, we get this vision in our head that the Jews just, they failed at everything, blah, 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 whatever. You know what? There were some people with some real faith in the mm-hmm. nation of Israel. And this, th- these are the people 
that are often ending up in our story, and we just kind of read right by them. Yeah. So anyway, Zechariah's inside, right? This whole big thing's going on, and, and uh, Luke continues. He says this, verse 11, And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him, right? Now, Samuel, normal every day, what do angels look like? Oh, puffy little child beings with wings that look cute and harmless and cuddly. Exactly, exactly. And I don't even know where that stuff comes from. (laughs) There's no image like that in the Bible whatsoever. Angels aren't Mm -hmm. cute little chubby baby cherubs with wings, okay? Zechariah, he was out of his senses. He was terrified at what he was seeing. And then things we don't notice, this angel, he appeared suddenly to his right, which if we know the orientation of the temple, it was on the north. And for what it's worth, the holiest sacrifices were slaughtered on the north side of the entrance. Okay? So so there was something kind of important in that. And then you know that Zechariah, you, you've got the big temple court, and then inside that you have the holy place. That's where Zechariah was with the altar of incense, right? That kind of stuff. But beyond that was the holy of holies. And Zechariah couldn't go in there. Only the high priest once a year. Well, the entrance into the Holy of Holies, that also was on the north side. So, I mean, we don't know. The angel could have just appeared out of nowhere. He could have stepped out from behind the curtain of the Holy of Holies. Mm. We don't know, right? But something big was happening right here before Zechariah's eyes. And again, if it wasn't already the most awesome moment of Zechariah's entire life, it is well, now. <laughs> yeah, that angel showed up. It just became so, right? So, again, uh, this is good storytelling. I mean, you know, th- they could make movies, television shows. If they yeah. didn't ruin them, they'd be great. But, people aren't gripped by the story so far. I don't know what is, because this is so interesting. Yeah, we need some background music's kind of building up the tension, right? Shindo. So, verse, <laughs> that's right, verse 13. The angel says to him, Don't be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. Remember a few moments ago when we were speculating about what John might be praying? Yeah. (laughs) What do you think now? Seems like it's a possibility. Right. It really does. He could have prayed for that son. Yeah. Yeah. And so here's Zechariah and, and, you know, beginning to appear more and more like a real man of faith, right? And so, interestingly, um, what we have here spoken by the angel, this, uh, well, um, this is the first of seven oracles that we find in chapters one and two of Luke, okay? This first one is spoken by an angel, and it's announcing the birth of John the Baptist, now, uh, it, it actually covers verses 13 to 17, and, and if you were looking at the Greek, and if you sort of had a mind for this kind of thing, you would actually see that verses 13 through 17 are poetry. And so, it, it leads to the question of, well, did God inspire the angel to speak in poetry? Or is Luke retelling the story? And using poetry as a medium to get across the speech, right? We don't really know the answers to these things, but something special is happening just in this speech itself, just in the the format of it, right? Um, But anyway, the angel has a message. And the first thing he says is, hey, don't be afraid. To which it's it's not written here, but I'm pretty sure I heard that Zechariah said, Easy for you to say. Okay, not really. I'm just kidding. (laughs) But the angel says, don't be afraid. 
And then he says, your prayer has been heard. We already talked about, gee, which one? And then just think, what is going through Zechariah's mind? I'm going to what? I'm going to have a son? Wait, in my old age? Dude, do you know who you're talking to? I'm the old guy. And I don't know if you remember, my wife is barren. Any of this ringing a bell, right? So even though you, and on one hand, you kind of see a Zechariah who seems to be a man of faith. On the other hand, it's easy to imagine him, you know, kind of faltering a little bit. What's mm-hmm. what's really going on? What 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 just happened? It must have taken him back in his mind to Abraham and Sarah, right? Oh, yeah. Sarah laughed. Uh, she, well, she almost scoffed at it. Yeah. Yeah. And then she told God that she didn't laugh. <laughs> oh, yeah. She, not only did she scoff, she lied, too. <laughs> yeah. And then what did God say? Uh, yes, she did. Yeah. <laughs> Just very nonchalant, corrects her. Yes, you did laugh. But so Zechariah, he's probably going back, right? Thinking about those stories, Abraham, Sarah, the birth of Isaac, and, and even back to Jacob and Rachel, right? The birth of Joseph. Joseph. Um, this is something that has been in Israel's history. You know Zechariah is familiar with it, and now he finds himself in the midst of it. That's got to be kind of freaky, kind of scary, right? Mm-hmm. But the angel continues. He says, uh, first he says, you're going to have a baby. You're going to name him John. He says, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. Now, again, on the surface, it doesn't sound like all that much is in there, but there's a lot going on. Okay? Now, okay, you will have joy and gladness. Well, Zechariah and Elizabeth, their whole, uh, don't you think, of course, I mean, duh, yeah, they're going to experience joy at this unexpected baby, but many will rejoice at his birth. This, this rejoicing is going to spread throughout Israel, especially among any who are going to actually heed this baby when he grows up, his call to repentance, right? They're going to receive this good news about the Messiah and the kingdom that's coming. We don't know that yet, but this this little baby, he's going to be great. And then the angel, you know, he, he elaborates on in what way that's going to be. But before he does, He makes a very interesting point. He says that he must not drink wine or strong drink. Now, can you think of anything in Scripture that sounds familiar about that, Samuel? Two different places. I know Samson wasn't allowed to drink strong wine or drink. And then Paul also in the New Testament had a time where he refrained from doing that for some reason. Right. And do you remember why? Anything, Anything coming to mind? It was called the Nazarite vow. Exactly. It's a Nazarite vow, which I just want to throw this out there. That has nothing to do with Nazareth. It has nothing to be do with being a Nazarene. It's a Nazarite vow. And it says, you know, some, some pretty common things. We'll talk about in a second. But for these people, okay, the people that, that are reading what Luke is writing, okay, in this time, in this place, this is a very clear and unambiguous statement. The angel was telling Zechariah that his baby was to be a Nazarite from the womb, just like Samson and just like Samuel. Ooh, Samuel. What about that? Your name's Samuel. Ah, that's right. Yeah. Even now, but I need to do one of those vows. Then maybe you should. Yeah. Now, uh, what's interesting because she, uh, uh, let me, let me try that again. Because he, the baby, John the Baptist, had to be a Nazarite from the womb, even Elizabeth had to follow all of the Nazarite restrictions while she was pregnant with him. So no grapes, no wine, no haircuts, no corpse contamination. She had to do all of that until John was born, and then they had to protect John from all of that, you know, while while they were raising him. So it's kind of amazing, kind of a neat picture. But 
also this idea that says that, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. I, I'm not saying that he wasn't filled with the Holy Spirit. Of course he was. Um, but But that phrase also would have had meaning back in this time. It would have been very akin to saying something like, he will be a prophet. So ultimately, what the angel is saying is, hey, you're going to have this baby. It's all going to be great. He's going to be great. He's going to be a Nazarite prophet, and he's going to be a Nazarite prophet from the womb. So, what? Pre- yeah, pretty heavy <laughs> stuff, right? And remember, where's Zechariah? He's in the holy place. There's incense, smoke all around. It's the one and only time he gets to do it in his life, and he's hearing all this from this big, scary angel. Right? It's a cool picture. Mm -hmm. It seems so filled with graciousness and mercy that the angel slash God would, you know, gift Zechariah this specifically for him and his family rather than, you know, maybe something more nationally oriented. I just... It just seems super cool that God met Zechariah for a particular purpose in his life in that moment, yeah. rather than doing something else. Yeah. And what's amazing is exactly what you said, but the ultimate call for this baby is national. Mm-hmm. And I mean, some would argue that it's it's universal, like the whole world, but but it's definitely national to Israel, right? Mm-hmm. It's It's a great picture. All right, so he goes on and he says, and he, that is John the Baptist, the baby, uh, when he grows up, will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord God. So there, there's no more prophet-like calling than this. He's, he's, he is going to call Israel to repent, right? And he will turn many. That turning is repentance. Mm-hmm. They're going to turn back to God. All right, and then, well, almost the final thing. He says this, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Now, Wow, that that is crazy and heavy. But let's let's look at this. It says he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. Okay, who's he and him? John the Baptist. John the Baptist will go before who? Oh, it's going to be uh, Messiah. It's that wisdom that's become flesh from our previous lesson. Yeah, that that's what we know is going to happen, and of course. Even this statement from the angel, it's very easy to believe that it's prophetic in some spots, right? He will go before him, and that's either the Lord, I mean, like God proper, if you want to think of it that way, or literally it's going to be Messiah in the person of Jesus, right? So it's it's neat. Um, just a little side note, if you wanted to, you could go look at Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. And you'll see that there's a very similar kind of declaration about Elijah for Jesus' second coming and the arrival of the kingdom. Now, it takes us a little outside the story here. Samuel, can you read that one real quick? Yeah, sure. Yeah, just just do that. Mm -hmm. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Yeah, yeah. So Elijah makes many, many appearances throughout all of the Old Testament history, and there are lots of traditions and stories about him, and they're not just about his actual life and ministry. A lot of things happen in relation to Elijah all throughout. So here's just another example. So he's being associated with Elijah, or John the Baptist is here. Uh, the What you just read associates him with Jesus. And then Jesus himself, a little bit later, also associates John the Baptist with Elijah. Uh, this happens in Matthew eleven fourteen, 14. Uh, and, and what we need to, I think probably it's important that we say it out loud, 
is that John isn't Elijah, literally. Okay, we we don't want to go there. But he will, though, herald the arrival of the kingdom and her king. He's going to prepare the people through his call for repentance. And he's going to turn the hearts from disobedience to righteousness, right? The, the, The wisdom of the just, as it said. Fathers will repent. Children will repent. Fathers and children repenting together. And it's all to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. I stole that one from Malachi 3, just so you know. To make ready for the Lord a people prepared. So this baby, he's got a lot going on. Mm -hmm. If people are thinking uh, to make a people prepared for what? You would say that they are being prepared for? A people prepared for the kingdom. Okay. Yeah. And that's, boy, uh, a whole bunch of information just flooded my brain, and I'm not going to share it all because it's going to take us way too far outside the box. What we're going to discover as we work our way through the Gospels, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to point some of this out you know, through the Old Testament scriptures and everything else, one of the, the most prominent goals contained within all of the scriptures is the kingdom. And I'm just going to say it out loud right now. We are not talking about something that's off in heaven. Just because we use the phrase kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven doesn't mean that it's up there. We're talking about a literal kingdom in this world where Jesus himself reigns as a king from Jerusalem. Okay? But that's what we're preparing the people for. Okay. All right. Well, it's it's good that people have that that nugget. They know that that's what we're referring to, and they should know that we're going to return to that a lot in the Gospels. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's going to come up, and and it, it if it sounded a little bit odd or strange to you when I said it just now, if you stick with us, give it a little bit of time, it's going to become very common, very ordinary. You'll just get used to it. And hopefully, hopefully buy into it because it makes sense. That's that's what we hope. Yeah. All right. So so here's Zechariah. He's in this place. The angels come. He's speaking all this stuff. And then we get to verse 18. And Zechariah says to the angel, how shall I know this? For I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years. Now, Samuel, does that seem like a fair question? I mean, yeah, it sounds almost exactly like what Abraham asked God when he told him he was going to have a child. Exactly. Exactly. It seems very, very normal. Now, um, to your point, others throughout scriptures have asked God for some kind of proof or some kind of sign, something. And generally speaking, that has worked out pretty well. I mean, people ask that every day, probably. How can I know this or that? Yeah, gosh, is this really you? Tell me, show me something so that I know that I know, right? So there's Zechariah. And then we we get to verse 19 and the angel answers him. I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. Uh, what? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Uh, of course, he probably couldn't get that out because he's unable to speak. Now, so, so here's Z, Zechariah, he's talking to Gabriel. But Gabriel, he's this no-nonsense hero angel of God. He's an archangel, right? Only two of them we even know the names of if we're, if we're sticking to the Bible alone. There's Gabriel and Michael, right? So to, to be fair, first Gabriel does answer his question, how shall I know this? And Gabriel tells him who he is and why he's come, right? So there's how you know. And then, well, Zechariah got his sign. He was mute. 
And people argue about this a lot. He may also have been deaf at the same time. He made him deaf and mute. And I'm going to show you much later when we get to Luke uh, verse 62, chapter 1, verse 62, you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. I actually think it's pretty reasonable to think that at this moment, Zechariah became both deaf and mute, okay? But, and this is kind of like what you said, the whole event, it, it's, it, it's bringing us back to Abraham, Sarah, and Isaac. They're old couples, it's a barren wife, questioning whether or not this is real or true. Isaac, uh, if, if we believe tradition, Isaac was born on Passover, which is one of the appointed times. This was all, you know, fulfilled in their time. It could be understood as at the appointed time, whichever. Uh, that's just me getting caught up in words. But if this is all true, this means that John is going to be born at Passover as well, right? You didn't believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. It's kind of like at the appointed time, right? Mm -hmm. So Jewish tradition says that Elijah will appear at Passover to announce the coming of Messiah. So if John the Baptist is being born, um, he's he's not literally Elijah, but right in in the in the spirit of Elijah, he could have been born at Passover as well, and that's reasonably important if you're trying to figure out, hey, when was Jesus born? Because people care about stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if listeners are going back to Genesis and looking at that Abraham story about God telling him about him having a son and comparing the two, you could say, responses from God or the angel, some may be saying, well, Abraham seemed to get off the hook a lot easier than Zechariah did. So any yeah. speculation as to why this was maybe a little more harsh, is it because um, the child is actually heralding the Messiah, the one that the whole story is built on rather than just a descendant of Messiah? Well, I mean, it's a really good question, and you're also offering a really good possibility. Um, I, I Okay, simple answer, I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, let's just get that straight out there. But I'll tell you that the thought that goes through my head, and it, right or wrong, doesn't matter, this is just the way I see it, Abraham was dealing with God himself, and God is perfect in all of his attributes, and he knows the thoughts of man inside and out, the whole thing. So when he was dealing with Abraham, it seems more reasonable that he was able to show mercy, if you will. But Gabriel, he's a man on a mission. Well, technically an angel on a mission, right? Yeah. He, I mean, he had a job to do, and what What are you doing, human? Questioning me. I've brought you an oracle from the Lord, right? <laughs> now, I don't know, maybe I'm being unfair to Gabriel, but, you know, Gabriel isn't God. And so, that's how they were dealing. And it's going to get even more interesting, so hold on to those thoughts. I'm not going to give this one away like I usually do, <laughs> but, but just remember how Gabriel responded to Zechariah. And we'll see how this all works out later. Okay? okay. Now, okay, so we're in there. We got all this stuff going on. And, and Luke continues in verse 21. He says this, and the people were waiting for Zechariah. And they were wondering at his delay in the temple, right? Now, this is the same multitude that we talked about. Uh, what was that? Like in verse 10, whatever. Same multitude waiting out there. And just so you know, back then, here's Zechariah entering so close to the presence of God, right? Everybody knows this is dangerous, even for priests. I mean, maybe, they, maybe they're wrong. Maybe they thought they were pure and they messed up. But the longer he delays, the more nervous they all get. They're all kind of fearing for his life, right? And it's not as if priests have never died before in the presence of God, okay? So he's kind of got everybody nervous with the delay. Yet when you were saying that the other priests were praying for Zechariah when he was in there, I was thinking just a little bit ago, they probably could have been praying for his protection because they knew of that dangerous nature of God whenever that priest went in there. Yeah, I think that's a very, very reasonable thought. 
they, they could have been, especially if they'd ever been in there themselves. Mm-hmm. I don't think that we can comprehend what it's like to be that near the presence of God in the way that they were in the temple. Now, side note, there are some people who think that there was no actual presence of God in the second temple. That Hmm. may or may not be right. I don't know. But just the thought of it, you know, imagining what it was like in the tabernacle in the first temple, uh, I I don't think we can relate. I really don't. So anyway, they're all getting nervous. Verse 22, and when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. Okay? Now, just so you get the picture, when Zechariah came out, he was supposed to raise his hands. And he was supposed to make this well-known priestly sign for the blessing and then actually give the the, the blessing, right? So, if you've ever seen Star Trek and Spock, you know how he does the live long and prosper and he's got the the two groups of fingers and you know the whole thing? Mm -hmm. Well, if you can imagine doing that with both hands and then putting your the tips of your thumbs together and reaching that out over the people, that is the priestly sign for the blessing. So, Spock is like a cheap knockoff, right? (laughs) And and this is the same blessing that comes from Numbers chapter 6, verses uh, 24 through 26, okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's very, very common, but that's what Zechariah was supposed to do. He's supposed to come out and give that blessing. So the thing is, he was making signs, but he wasn't making the sign, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and so somehow they realized uh, that he had seen a vision. But that blessing, uh, Samuel, can you read that from number six, verses 24 to 26? Sure. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Yeah. So you've probably heard that somewhere, whether that's in your local church or maybe some TV show, movie, something, whoever. That's the blessing he's supposed to give. So he comes out and and he's not doing it because he can't speak. He's making signs, but he's not making the sign. And so they figure it out. Something happened to Zechariah in the temple. So uh, now, interestingly, that's kind of like the end of the dramatic part of the story. It just, Luke just immediately gets to verse 23 and he just says, and when his time of service was ended, he went to his home, right? (laughs) But I mean, you know, it had to end somewhere. Verse 24, and after these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. And for five months, she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. So you got to imagine, here's Zechariah. He's trying to finish out his week of service. Now, thankfully, he didn't have to work every day, right? They didn't do that. But still, in some sense, you got to think that was kind of weird. But he gets back home. And Elizabeth conceives. And it, it, it's even possible, Luke, he may have been purposely trying to connect the reader to the story of Hannah because she conceived after returning from the temple, right? Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a, a light or a loose connection, but it's there. But, but it, how strange that Elizabeth, she keeps it a secret for five full months. And that may not be all. Wow. Yeah, we're going to see later. But five full months, and ultimately, we're going to see when we picked up in our next episode, she ends up getting outed by Gabriel and Mary later, right? We'll see that. But the the, the important part is that Elizabeth fully acknowledges what God has done for her. And she even equates what it is God has done for her to what God did for for Rachel, because back in that story about Rachel, the, 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 the words are along the lines of taking away her disgrace. And, and Elizabeth here says, take away my reproach, right? So uh, we didn't get near as far in this chapter as I'd hoped, but that's the story, the opening story of 
Zechariah and Elizabeth, and that's where Luke wants to begin his telling of this whole gospel. Mm -hmm. And when you bring up taking away reproach among people, correct me if I'm wrong, it's not as if um, she's saying that God is the one that has given her this reproach. It's more in terms of how people in that Eastern culture t treated and looked at women who were barren because it was such a big deal in patriarchal culture for a mother to be able to produce an heir for a family. And she's saying, like, you've, you've taken away that burden that I've had to deal with for my entire life. Yeah, yeah. It's so sad to think, out, uh, think of it from here, from this time. But man, back then, if you were a woman who could not produce a child, couldn't produce a son, you really, you just were looked down on. And mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't seem fair at all, but it just was, that was, that was reality. Yeah. And I guess we're going to get into the habit of it. Hopefully bringing this up is a good idea, but um, Bema Discipleship, which is another ministry that we use their content and find it helpful. We can put a specific episode in the show notes talking about uh, someone who is trusted in the story of God, what that looks like in terms of treating someone who is barren, specifically some Midrashic interpretations of how Abraham treated Sarah whenever they met and he took her to be his wife. Super good about how he treated her with unbelievable dignity. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We'll try and put lots of interesting little things in the show notes just so people... Mm -hmm. I mean, if all you do is listen to us, uh, you know, you you're not getting you're not getting a good deal. You need yeah. <laughs> you need resources from all over. And you know what? Sometimes you're going to like them, mm -hmm. and sometimes not. Sometimes you'll uh, you might even agree or disagree or whatever. That's okay. I mean, we're not going to put a whole bunch of just goofy stuff on there. Just things that no. that have we think bring value. You know? Yeah. That actually reminds me of quickly uh, of a midrash I read about Psalm one three where it talks about um, the man of Torah. He's like a tree planted by streams of water. The rabbi said that that Hebrew word uh, "planted" actually is literally transplanted, and they were saying that it's almost that language is indicating almost that the man has been uprooted from somewhere and then planted somewhere else near water and they were evoking the meaning of uh, a man of wisdom doesn't learn from one teacher alone but from many places you transplant yourself and you oh. go other places to glean wisdom which is really cool it is it is yeah and and do we not have to be um discriminating in our tastes <laughs> yeah yeah we do Right? You can't just listen to anybody everywhere. You just, you can't. But there are some really good resources out there, and you should you should take advantage of them all. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Anything else you got for us before we close today? No, man, I am all talked out. Ha! Lie! <laughs> <laughs> but no, I don't have anything else to add. Okie dokie. Oh! Well, thank you for listening to the Okie Dokie Most podcast. Please don't forget to subscribe so that you never miss an episode. You can also visit us at www.okidokimost.com for more information or to listen online. Until next time, we hope and pray that you will do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, one who rightly handles the word of truth. We'll talk to you again soon. <laughs>